Mike, you've been here since the weekend. Uh, a lot going on for you with the competition committee. What came out of all that that you were pleased with that you'll take to the owners' meetings at the end of March? Well, still have another day, I think, or at least some conversations that we'll go into potentially tomorrow. Um, really just want to try to get some clarifications uh, just so that our fans and everybody understands we're trying to make the officiating as consistent as possible. Right now there's there's a range, and, and we feel like that there should be a tighter target area between – groups of officials right uh, group or official one to 17 those crews should be a little tighter than what their what their pattern is and how everybody sees it and hopefully sees it the same so we're trying to trying to do that trying to clean up re what replay assists looks like um, but there's so much more it's, it's player safety and welfare and, and trying to take these helmet impacts uh, and contacts and, and try to to get them down and always try to, to get them down and continue to figure out and, re and decide what's, what's realistic and what's, what's best for the game, what's best for the players, um, the, the technology of football, the future of football, international program. You know, so there's a lot just more than, than what goes on on the, the three hours on Sunday. How much do those conversations, having them now during the off season, get your brain churning for things maybe you might want to tweak within your own system? Well, I think you're always looking to do things um, within the rules, um, but also to try to gain whatever advantage that you possibly could, whether that's formationally. There's, you know, a lot of conversation about the the the, the push on the quarterback sneak, and you know where our tolerances is. is you know, for for that play and, and what we think that that may, you know, look like or um, j just how we want to try to tackle the quarterback. I think that, you know, I think Mike Tomlin put it best. We're always telling them what they can't do. We need to tell them what they can do and, and try to give great examples of that uh, so that we can reasonably teach it because it, it's hard to be in a position where you say, well, I don't know. When a player asks, well, coach, what should I be able to do or what can I do here? I don't ever want to be in a position where I say, I don't know. Coach, you, this is the second time around the block for you on the, the competition committee. So is there something in the second lap around that maybe you didn't think about in year one? Or is it a year-to-year -year basis based on things I, that happen to you situationally in games? I, I think it's just, um, you know, I never want to be a part of a group or add input if it just applies to the Tennessee Titans. I, I don't want that. I want to try to have an open mind and think about what's best for 32 clubs, what's best for every player uh, and every fan, and not just say, well, we had this happen to us, so we should, you know. They, talking about the tablets, our tablets went down on the sideline in Washington, and how the rule was written in the game manual was that Unless both the coach's box and the, and the field tablets were out, then Washington would still be able to use theirs. Didn't think much of it at the time. Just said, hey, we'll, we'll adjust. We'll figure it out. We'll make it work. Like, this is what it is. Um, but you look at it, and, you know, that came up. And we said, well, that probably makes a little bit more sense just to say if they don't, one side doesn't have field tablets for a quarter, well, then – we should at least take the other ones until those are back up and running. So, you know, that was a case where something applied to us. I didn't even think about it until the game ops crew. I said, oh, yeah, I guess they did go out in Washington. But it was like, well, we're just keep it moving and, and just things like that. I was watching the Super Bowl, and I had one question that I had to ask you. And that is, you have talked about, and you've corrected me multiple times, especially in the preseason when I talk about points of emphasis. You said there should not be points of emphasis. We should call the rule book. When the play happened late in the game on the hold, and there was controversy from the start with television raising the point that, oh, you shouldn't call that at this point in the game. You should let them play. It's hard to see it end that way, more or less, is what the comment was. In your mind, based on your feeling about we should call the rule book. I don't think it should matter what the down and distance is. So you what think the it was absolutely is. the right call. I, I just am telling you that whether I agree or disagree with the call, uh, I'm telling you that I, there's, there's only one way to officiate, and that's to make sure that it, it is what the rules are. And if it's on the one-yard line 
or at midfield or if it's first and 10 or third and one or fourth and one or there's two minutes left in the game or there's 13 minutes left in the first quarter I just feel like that that's the only way to get those men and women to to do their job and feel confident in officiating and and taking out the the interpretation well do they want me to no this is what they want you to do and if you see the mechanisms you see the restriction and you feel strongly about it then then throw the flag like that that's the only way that you can ultimately get to where we've started this conversation was that to narrow the gap between the ones that are called and the ones that want or the or that weren't or the ones that were called and we didn't want called like that's what there's two different types of you know the grading scale is, is the calls that were missed or the ones that were no calls that we want called uh, or the ones that were called and we would rather let go so two things can be true it's disappointing that that play had such an impact and yet it was a foul and it had to be called that those both can be true that it's an unfortunate time to create a penalty where a jersey's tugged the quarterback's looking at that vicinity not that that's part of the rule but that you know i mean there's certainly a lot of things that go into it um so that, that i i don't think you can officiate based on other circumstances You mentioned player safety, and there's been talk about expanding use of the guardian caps. Um, After one year, a full season of using them throughout training camp, using them throughout the course of the season, what did you think of them? What was the response from your players? Do you think that was an effective tool? I do. I think that the numbers would tell us that it was. Um, The the number of concussions that we had in training camp, I I don't want to say zero, but I think it was pretty darn close. Um and there was no pushback. I think initially uh, they they maybe questioned it, but but in the long run, uh, when I said, "Hey, just put them back on for practice," like this is what we're going to do, no no player questioned it. No player, um, you know. And I think that that's important that we're looking out for their best interest. And you know, sometimes you you relax in practice, and it's it's uh, you know something that happens, and, and you catch a, a hit from the side where you really weren't expecting it and uh, that can protect that and there, there, that's a significant amount of impact when you talk about reducing it 15 to 20 percent if both players have a guardian cap on I mean I think the biggest uh, restriction was just the equipment room and their ability to have to take them off and put them back on so I want to thank Joey uh, his staff uh, for, for working hard to get those off for the games and for us to travel you know, and then putting them back on. I think that'll be easier in, in the new model. Uh, it sounds like that's something that's going to change and, and help um, the process. This week is one of the better parts for you being able to sit down in front of these young men and kind of peek behind the curtain, see who they are? Well, it's the first opportunity sometimes. Maybe we've had some exposure with them at the Senior Bowl. Um, but but it's it's 18 minutes or 15 minutes in an informal setting. Uh, for them to earn another opportunity, in, in my mind, uh, to, to really pique my interest, uh, for me to follow up and, you know, haven't been able to watch every single player. Uh, so this is an opportunity f- to give me reason to go watch um, whatever player that may be, man, I really enjoyed that visit and could see him being on the football team. Let's see what type of player he is and, and start to build the profile. So that that's critical we got that started last night we'll have those again uh tonight tomorrow morning um but the, we're you know we're off to a good start you're doing that with a new partner yeah in in, Ran, in Rand carthon how has that relationship built over the last five weeks six weeks i i think it's built been built great um we haven't had a whole lot of you know we, we work through some some things with some contracts um but I think as we start to, to blend our staffs and to try to get those uh, two staffs to kind of understand and work together, I'm excited about that. That started and been going on here at the Combine. We'll work through free agency, um, continue to, to work and look at the roster and, and how we want to uh, shape this thing, uh, knowing that it, it'll look vastly different uh, in training camp or in September than it does today. Uh, understand that. Um, but it's it's been good. It's been really good. Just to uh, you know, a couple new faces with him and, and Chad, and so that's been really good to kind of hear their perspective and 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 start to work. 
some new faces within your coaching staff as well and some people kind of changed around with some different roles and responsibilities. How do you take this week to kind of understand what it is that they're looking for in players in terms of people who will be in their individual rooms and kind of their styles and preferences? Yeah, the, the, I, I want their, their preferences to be our preferences and I, and I you know, appreciate their own opinions um, as does Rand. But there has to be a structure where you're starting and, and, and about the, the type of player that we're looking for and who they are as a person, what their play style is, what their ability is, uh, their their willingness to – their capacity to learn, not only that, but their willingness to learn, how, how hard they work at it. Um, and so we've, we've started that. We've done that and had conversations about that back at uh, St. Thomas Sports Park. Uh, had got to sit down with – you know, probably four position coaches last night for a, for an hour and 50 minutes uh, in an informal setting. Uh, we went through a lot of front seven players that we were able to get downstairs uh, in, in an informal setting, and it was really cool to be a part of that, to, to watch them work and, uh, you know, bringing guys through. I mean, Bobby was meeting with D. Lyman uh, just because Big T was meeting with somebody else, and Crow was meeting with an inside linebacker because Bobby was meeting with an inside linebacker, and uh, I really, really was impressed by, by what they were able to do last night. That was their only opportunity, the way that the combine set up. That was their only opportunity for those front seven players to meet informally with coaches. And I don't know if that was an oversight or just a scheduling, but every other position group has two opportunities with their position coaches to meet on an informal basis. You know, it's, hey, I want to meet with Amy after she meets with the, with the Chargers or Mike after he meets with the Bengals. And, and the D-line, the linebackers, and the edge players, they only had the, the one night last night. So we, we, were, we were humping and jumping, and, and those guys did a fantastic job. In a small sample size like that, how much of, put the tape to the side, how much of it in, in figuring out does a guy love ball? How much of that is a part of the process? Well, I love it, football. It, yeah, I mean, you can tell me that, and I'm sure that I would believe you, but I can view that. I, I can view if a guy's out there straining fighting if he's into it if he's supporting his teammates if he's jumping up and down if he you know what 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 other you know we all love the games you know we all love holding the baby but do we love being pregnant and that's that's the process that you have to go in and study and find out uh who to believe at some of these schools because they all tell you different things how much is determined already about your 30 visits to Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park before you even start the interview process here? There, there's probably been some, but, but not all. You know, I mean, I think uh, one thing that we have been able to do is isolate or identify, excuse me, some of those players that we may want to bring back on, on as early as Tuesday and, and get that started. Um, the year they shut it down with COVID, we actually had a couple players already in, and then they, they did away with visits. Um, so that's been good. We all kind of come together and say, hey, who do you think? And, you know, if everybody's on everybody's list, if the same person's on everybody's list, then we should probably bring them in. Uh, some of those players w- would be draftable but non-combine invites that we may want to look at, um, you know, trying to find the next, you know, mayor of Murfreesboro. Uh, that that had draftable grade that wasn't a combine invite uh, that you bring in to to get some information on. Along with all of the things that you're doing here, you also have a roster of guys back in Nashville that you're dealing with, and there's a lot of things going on. We saw some roster moves earlier this month. There's more to come with free agency looming. How do you balance thinking about both worlds, the upcoming draft and these prospective players, but also the guys that you already have? Well, nothing's more important than the players on your team. There's nothing more important. Um, so you have to have a vision for the ones that, that you feel like you have going forward. Um, try to communicate with them. Ask them to communicate with you as far as an individual development plan, what they saw and how they felt like their, their mental and physical performance was uh, through the course of the season, uh, what they liked about it, what they want to continue to do, uh, well and what they would like to try to maybe focus on and, and change. You're into March. Now it all starts. Uh, the legal tampering period is 12 <laughs> days away. Free agency is two weeks away. 
I mean, it's on. How much of your time do you spend meeting with various people for the next 12 days to 14 days, figuring out what free agency strategy looks like and then rolling it forward to how that will affect what you're able to do towards the draft? Well, we've done that. We've done that extensively. That's part of what we've done with myself and Rand and, and his staff. And, you know, the coaches evaluated players, and I watched them, and we all watched them together and you know, try to build a profile on the player and, and kind of feel like, you know, if, if this is somebody that based on you know, fit and value, uh, this is somebody we'd like to add to the football team. Not not every player over the, out there is going to fit your team from a lot of different reasons. Uh, you know, free agency can be tricky. You know, you have to know who you're bringing on to the football team, and you know, if somebody hasn't been with them, or you know them fairly well, that's that's a risky proposition just to to, to jump into something like that. Finally, you making Tim Kelly available here at the NFL Combine, your new offensive coordinator. The decision to do that, your thought process? Well, I mean, people have a lot of uh, questions about where we may head. And, you know, Tim didn't speak to the media this year. Um, so I felt like, um, you know, it just wasn't his his place. I didn't think we needed to go down that road. And so, therefore, I felt like I wanted to make him available to speak on, on the offense's behalf, on his behalf, on the offensive staff's behalf. And, you know, excited for that to happen here. And. Justin Outen added to your staff as the running back coach coming over from Denver, um, a really well thought of guy who got his start in high school Spe- football. Special ed teacher, Spring Westfield. Yeah. I Cor- mean, Corby Meekins, really good program down there in Spring, Texas. You'd love it. I mean, to elevate. 40,000 40, football fans yeah. on a Friday night, Mike. The you real thing. I games. would love it. You would. But the That's your retirement job down there, right? Probably. Probably so. Um, KDISD. Okay. Yeah, sure, That's that would be you. great. Katie, yeah, absolutely. That's you. Okay, so this guy has had an, an, an amazing rise. He's really well thought of. Why bring him in? Why running backs? And what do you hope he adds? Well, I, that was where the role was. That's where the opportunity was. I had made a decision about Tony and what I wanted to try to see there. Um, had met with Charles and uh, wanted to try to find a way to add him. I met with Justin. Um, was was upfront on what the role would be, but also maybe what the vision would be. Just trying to add a bunch of really good coaches and people. Um, did that defensively as well at some spots. So, um, you know, I want people to know that it was well thought out. It was well planned. It wasn't just something that I, you know, threw together. Uh, tried to, you know, and it's hard. It's hard to get every person that you want an interview, and you know, it's it's hard to go from college or pro team to to pro team and sometimes that movement uh isn't as supported throughout the league because you can block a coach or they just they have an opportunity at the place that they've been for a few years the mix on that offensive staff really interesting i mean a a totally different i mean i'm sure they everybody looks at football slightly differently but that group it would feel like with Tim Kelly leading it with Justin with Charles with Jason taking over the offensive line Tony moving to tight ends and then keeping Rob Moore where he was I mean it's a it's an impressive group and it, well it's I mean, only as impressive it it, no, it's yeah. only as impressive as as what they can can teach and reasonably get the players to understand and execute right. that that's the most important thing and um I think, and, I, and obviously I did it for a reason, and so hopefully it, that, that comes true uh, and that they are able to add their ideas together. Uh, Tim's able to coordinate it, and everybody's able to have their their ideas and thoughts and vision uh, heard and then ultimately go in a direction in which everybody uh, is on the same page. Good stuff, as always. Head you got it, buddy. Mike Vrabel, we appreciate you.